soldiers in Naples of the Allied military government. Here, Neapolitans, anxious to return to a normal life, are applying for jobs to help rebuild their city. Water facilities destroyed by the Nazis, army engineers distill seawater for drinking from the Bay of Naples. Water that means life or death to thirsty Neapolitans. A tiny American plane comes in for a landing on a boulevard adjoining the bay. From it steps the commander of the Allied Fifth Army, Lieutenant General Mark Clark, here to inspect conditions in the city. On roads back of Naples, American troops skirt the city as they push on in pursuit of the Nazi army. At other points, fresh troops come ashore. Huge invasion boats pouring in reinforcements, even under the bombs of enemy aircraft. Airports of Foggia, captured by the British Eighth Army. Wrecked planes that never got off the ground. Nazi prisoners beneath the light guns, hurrying to the rear. From Italian and African ports, thousands more embark for prison camps overseas. in the Canadian forests, lumberjacks are cutting great stands of Douglas fir to provide more timber for United Nations war industries. by the train load, these 500-year-old giants of the forest are producing some two billion feet of lumber a year. Nimble lumberjacks prepare to float the logs down the river. The Canadian timber crop is on its way to war. An Italian bomber, a three-motored Savoia Marchetti, streaks for an air base first of many units of the Italian air arm to join United Nations forces as co-belligerents in war against the Nazis. As American and Italian officers exchange greetings, new units of Italian fighter planes roar in. Just as men of the Italian Navy brought their ships to Allied ports, so do these Italian flyers follow the orders of their government. Right now, they're enjoying an American meal. In the jungles of northern Burma, Lieutenant General Stilwell, commander of United States forces in China, directs American trained and equipped Chinese soldiers as they take up new positions across the Salween River. General Stilwell well knows the wilderness in which he fights. Hacking through the jungle, 
Advance units are constantly in contact with Japanese patrols. fire anti-aircraft batteries that are helping keep the skies clear of enemy raiders. Behind the lines, American and Chinese nurses work hand in hand caring for the wounded. Chinese troops, equipped with new Lend-Lease materiel from America, push through roads still muddy from the rains of the monsoon season. Overhead, planes of the 14th United States Air Force are on the alert. Somewhere out over the broad Pacific, the greatest task force of ships and planes ever assembled steams to attack the Japanese on Wake Island. Flat tops bearing more planes than have ever before been carried into naval action, ready their fighters and dive bombers for the United States Navy's second major assault upon this vital enemy-held stronghold. some 4,000 miles from the United States mainland, the Navy moves into waters less than 2,000 miles from Tokyo. It was here the Japanese attacked American Marines, even as their emissaries in Washington were talking of peace. Now, through the cottony puffs of clouds, Wake Island's strategic three square miles of sand and coral lies beneath the bomb sites of United States Navy planes, within firing range of the Navy's big guns. fuel storage tanks, and gun emplacements are our principal objectives. Now comes a low-level bombing attack with the enemy airfield hit again and again. Japanese ship is caught within the fire of the fighter planes. The Navy's Grumman Hellcats sight and down a Japanese bomber. There goes another. Another. American losses, 13 planes, and but one pilot. Even this fellow lands safely. On the ground, more than 60 Japanese planes are destroyed. The Navy leaves Wake Island smoking. More than 700 tons of bombs, shells, and aerial high explosives are dropped. Wake Island, as an enemy stronghold, is reduced to a battered spot of sand in the Pacific. 